WXXI and the Little Theater. This is Movies in a Microphone, Zoom edition, our second Zoom edition. Uh, so today's episode, we are talking about the Oscars, the 2021 Oscars. Uh, a lot of thoughts on snubs, predictions, our favorite movies of the year. Uh, so our guest, again, the Movies in a Microphone favorites have returned to the Zoom Ooh, platform. favorites. <laughs> well, we, we love everyone, but... <laughs> Uh, so we have Adam Lubatel, film critic for City Newspaper, and Jackie McGriff, photographer, little super fan, and and hot take uh, deliverer. <laughs> we, we're coming to you for the hot takes here on this stuff, Jackie. We know you can deliver the goods for that. Um, so we're going to start off uh, best picture. I, I think that's the place that we should start. That's always the big prize. I, I'm going to read off the nominees here uh, for everyone. So Oscar best picture 2021. The Father, Judas and the Black Messiah, Mank, Minari, Nomadland, Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, and The Trial of the Chicago Seven. So that's that's this year's, which first of all, I remember there was talk about maybe canceling the Oscars because, oh no, we have to cancel. Movies are, are you know, we're not getting the good stuff. But this was a yeah. really good year for movies, which we talked about in the last podcast. and. That's a, that's a solid list, I feel. So, we're ready. Yeah. So what, what do you guys, best picture, what were your thoughts when, the, when these were announced? Jackie, I'm gonna start with you for this. What, what went through your head when you, when you first read or, or saw or heard them, these best picture uh, nominees? The very first thought was, um, <laughs> it was, where's One Night in Miami? Um, that, was my, <laughs> that was my first reaction. Um, I, it was like a mix. It was that. It was, I'm so glad the Minari and Judas um, and Promising Young Woman, they're all on the best picture list. So I was very excited and happy about that. Um, I did have my fears of like Minari being put into just the best foreign film category, even though it's an American film. Um, but when I saw it for best picture, I was really, really excited. So those are like my first thoughts seeing best picture list go. <laughs> How about you, Adam? Was it was there happiness, kind of a little bafflement, or both, maybe? Um, yeah, I think it's as you said, it's a pretty strong, solid collection of films, um, and I feel like even with this weird Oscar season that has been elongated, because like usually by this time we the Oscars have already happened and we're just getting the nominations. Um, so I was curious, you know, earlier on if that would have any difference, but I feel like this is. I feel like this is what would have been nominated either way. Like this seems like the movies that the Academy tends to focus on or like, cause I, I thought maybe, you know, a, like first cow early on, I was wondering if like with this weird season, if something like that would sneak in, cause that's not traditionally a movie that Oscars usually go for. So I thought maybe that had a shot this year, but that didn't even get a single nomination. So I'm happy, but yeah, not super surprised by what ended up in here. Um, although I am, I will say I'm ecstatic that uh, Sound of Metal did so well because I'm a huge fan of that movie. Um, and I wasn't sure if that was going to get as much attention as I felt it deserved. Because I saw that uh, at the Toronto International Film Festival back in 2019 and it kind of got delayed. And then with this past year, it got, you know, kind of a sort of release some places and then just pushed out on Amazon. So I'm, I'm super happy that that did it as well as it did because it's a great movie and everyone should see it. I, uh, yeah, that was the first movie I saw in a movie theater it, since March, 2020, because I, I rented out the little and saw it, which was a movie deserving of the big screen uh, treatment just because the sound in it is such a huge factor. Um, so The Sound of Metal, to recap, is about a heavy metal drummer who loses his hearing. Um, so it's his journey of, of going deaf and, and what's that like. So so the the sound is a huge part because it'll show you, like, it'll kind of, it helps you experience um, what Riz Ahmad's character is going through, uh, which which was a very, yeah, a good film. And the, the best way to watch it probably is not through Amazon and on your TV where Amazon, they, I, I, the movie, so the director's choice was to present the film in open captions too, which I which I loved. Mm -hmm. 
I, I you know, we should see more movies with open captions, I feel, um, which I, I don't think the Amazon version maybe had that. I, I, I'm maybe repeating a rumor, so I don't know how accurate that is. I've just heard from other people where they had to turn on the captioning. Um, so yeah, I was yeah. happy to see that as well. Um, I do, so I, I would like to see, I, obviously there was some snobs one night in Miami. I still think I would like to see more, something like a documentary for Best Picture and two of my favorite films of the year, which we'll talk about a little when we talk about the documentary category, were, were docs. So it was Boys State, which didn't get a nomination at all. Um, and then The Mole Agent, which did get nominated for, for Best Documentary. Um, so I, I just, I, at some point, I feel like we should be seeing a, a doc for Best Picture, but considering every year we've done this podcast, we've, we've said that it's probably never going to happen just because it's, it seems to be a very narrow focus when, when the Academy's looking at Best Picture. There, there's a type they like, and sometimes we'll see a nice, like something like um, Parasite, so normally we don't see international movies nominated either, uh, or movies that don't primarily uh, have English as the main language. So, so that's nice to see. Um, and of course, sometimes you have silent films like The Artist or something, but I would like to see a little branch out, especially in a year like this, which was not a normal year. I think that was the year to really dig deep into what was released and, and come up with, with maybe a different list. Um, yeah, any I'm, other best picture thoughts then before we move on? Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm hopeful that as the Academy kind of continues their efforts to diversify uh, who's included in their, their membership, I'm hoping that we'll see things kind of shift and an unexpected, traditionally unexpected movies uh, will start sneaking in there and it'll become, it'll become normal to see, you know, documentaries for best picture and international features so I'm hoping I'm hoping that trend continues, because yeah, I was with everyone who was ecstatic last year when Parasite was able to win. Um, but yeah, in terms of best picture, I I'm a big fan of uh, Nomadland, and I will say The Father, um, which I feel like I think is just getting kind of a release right now. So I feel like that's the one that most people haven't seen yet. So I feel spoiled <laughs> that I saw it at, uh, at, at Toronto this past year virtually. Um, so I've seen it twice um, and everyone else I talked to hasn't seen it yet, but it's great. Um, uh, Anthony Hopkins, Olivia Coleman were both nominated. Um, uh, it's sort of about uh, Olivia Coleman. Uh, Anthony Hopkins is her father. Um, he's uh, experiencing dementia is increasingly his state of mind is is going and the movie just kind of follows their relationship and it it's based on a play uh, and it does such a good job of putting you in his head and experiencing the world how he's seeing it like you're unsure like he she's his daughter but then you're like wait is she actually his daughter? And, and the, the like, the location, the production design is amazing. Like the the apartment kind of changes throughout the movie. It just it's a movie I really hope people check out because it it sounds like a movie that's kind of Oscar homework, but it's it's almost like a a thriller when you watch it. It's it's so good. Um, so yeah, I hope people check that out when they have an opportunity in this weird release landscape. <laughs> I hope people get a chance to see it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to toss that out there because it's good. And I feel like that on its face looks like, oh yeah, that, that looks like an Oscar movie, but it's really not, it's, uh, it's, it's so good. The trailer, like looks, yeah, the trailer looks amazing. I was like, cause it, it gives off, that trailer gives off the vibe of like, you're kind of seeing his life through, through his eyes as he's going further and further in, like into dementia. Like mm -hmm. question, really, like just questioning his surroundings and questioning who his family members are. Like that is what like um, drew me in, and so I'm hoping that I'm able to watch that, you know, somewhere. So yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I think it's I think it'll be at least available on VOD sometime soon. I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head, but at some point in the next week or so. I think it's next Friday. So we're we're recording this on a Friday, the nineteenth. I, I think it's the twenty sixth. Maybe that that sounds right. Um, that sounds yeah. That sounds right. right. I, I'm going to that as I saw that you like to tweet at him that had information. <laughs> well, there it is. Oh, I'm glad you said that. That was a movie where I kind of had I, I guess 
that Oscar homework mentality for it. And part of mm -hmm. it is the subject matter. I, I think deep yeah. dealing with a family member with Alzheimer's, a lot of us have, uh, and it's, it's difficult. It's not, so I just, the idea of that, you don't always get excited to watch it. So I'm really glad to hear you say, to praise this film. And obviously just from, you know, reading people I trust to, I, well, you included Adam, I, I got me excited for, for that one. Um, so obviously I don't think, have you seen all these Best Picture uh, nominees, Adam, or? Uh, yes. I oh, okay. I was going to say, I know Jackie and I haven't. Um, I was going to say, usually, usually it doesn't work out that way. Usually when the nominations come out, there are at least a couple, but no, I've actually seen all of them this year. All the Best Picture nominees, and I haven't seen everything <laughs> that's been nominated. What? You want to give us your thoughts on like how you see this playing out, maybe like how they rank in your head, or if you think that'll differ from, well, probably it most likely will differ on Oscar night, but yeah. Oh boy. Um, oh god. I think my I loved Nomadland, and my gut says it may actually end up winning just because it's done so well. Uh, award-wise this whole kind of award season, um, especially Chloe Zhao, uh, the director, who has won basically every award so far. Um, so I feel like, I mean, we can get into her director, but I feel like she's a lot, but I also feel like that'll, that'll carry the movie through too. Um, but I could also, I could also make a case for a bunch of these. I can also see Minari maybe sneaking in there or Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, which is also a great movie. I have a hot take about that. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I'm excited to hear this. Uh, I feel like those those are kind of my my gut reaction, like the the potential actual winners. Um, yeah, because the rest are uh, solid movies, but yeah, my gut says I don't think they have a shot. But I want to hear from Jackie now. I want to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. So. I just make, must make the disclaimer that I did enjoy this movie. Um, I thought it was very compelling. Um, got you thinking about, about a lot of things. Um, but I'm hoping that Judas and the Black Messiah does not win. And here's why. Um, okay, so it's, I'm not spoiling anything. So it gets all in the trailer. It's basically about, um, an FBI informant. It's, it's basically like you're kind of looking through the eyes of a FBI informant um, at Fred Hampton. And what I'm getting sick and tired of, especially since um, there were there was a recent announcement about um, 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 a Marcus Garvey film being done, but the way in which it's being done is is similar to this, where it's through the eyes of like someone else or someone else who like works for the government essentially. And I'm just like, can we just get, can we just get the film where it's in their eyes rather than like from somebody else? I feel like ugh, there, there, there are too many of these movies that are not being, that are about important people in our past that aren't, that we're, we're not getting their voices. Like we're not getting their voices, what they thought, like the, the kind of like conversations that they were having with other people, not like, through somebody else and then to like so for that to win is essentially saying this is the way that we want you know to hear our stories like if that if Judas and the Black Messiah wins that's basically to me at least putting out the message that oh this is how we should you know talk about Black historical figures from now on like through the eyes of somebody else and I'm like no like let's focus on that actual character because I felt like while watching the movie I wasn't really learning a lot about Fred Hampton. There were like some moments with him because obviously like, you know, there's the famous speech and there's like other things going on that obviously involve him. But I didn't really feel like I was like kind of getting a crash course on who Fred Hampton really was and why he was so essential um, to the Black Panther movement. So a party, so I just, yeah, I, I'm hoping that it doesn't win. And not necessarily in the same sense, because I was very, I was very angry about Green Book winning, but for like so many other like different reasons, just because, yeah. like I said, I could create a whole podcast. <laughs> but like, I'm just like moving forward. I don't want that to be the staple as to how we tell 
stories, especially, especially of uh, those, not just like of black historical figures, but of other, you know, people of color and indigenous people as well. Like I, I didn't like the way that the movie was, like the, the story was being told, I guess. Um, and well, not, I guess that, that I just didn't like the way it was structured. So I hope that, that would not be, that that wouldn't win very well. Like I love the acting. It was fantastic. Um, really just oh, gut-wrenching, but at the same time, I don't want that to be the standard. So that's my, that's my hot take. Yeah, <laughs> it was the, the Judas was the, was the large focus of that, which I yeah. did not realize going in that it was, I was like, man, uh, Daniel Clue is Fred Hampton. has been off screen for a very long time here. I, was which like, I, just, I, I thought going in and I watched the trailer, so I should have realized this, but I thought it was Fred Hampton film and yeah it wasn't yeah. it and <laughs> like i'm like but it's and the black facade <laughs> like, like you talk about both equally like i don't yeah it oh, yeah hey well I, you know i can't pretend to know what shaka king like he was the director of this film but right. what maybe the thinking was here my kind of thought was we've seen films with that kind of formula something like the departed something that adds suspense that has done well. So I wonder if they're like, we need this angle of there's this informant, will he get caught? Which is very suspenseful. And I, I like this movie a lot, but sometimes I wonder, do, do you need that? I mean, Fred Hampton's story is a pretty good story too. Like Hello, you, you don't and, necessarily need that. And, and, so. and he is in two films this year, which I didn't realize that trial yeah. Chicago 7, he'd also be referenced like they're in it. And, and so I'm like, we have two Fred Hampton movies and I, technically, and I still don't know. <laughs> they still don't know everything. Like otherwise, I would advocate for watching the, the Black Panther doc that's mm. currently out uh, from like through PBS and stuff. Because I, or there's another. Well, there's that's more like the Black Panther. There's the more talking about the Black Panther Party. But I think I learned more about Fred Hampton in that than I did in this, which is saying something. And also, I think I think what they did was like I don't know if the angle was in this movie was to try to humanize. Um, the part of Judas, but like I just William, I can't like I I I don't empathize with him at all. Like I, throughout this movie, I was just like, no, he was a piece of crap. Like I don't I don't care. Like so, I, I don't know if that was what they were trying to go for. I didn't I didn't feel that at least um, yeah. that it was very humanizing because it's just yeah yeah yeah. I, I'm <laughs> curious. Yeah, I was gonna say I haven't read any interviews with Shaka King. I'm sure he's talked about his decision to how he structured the movie and the main focus being on, on the Judas of the, the Judas and the Black Messiah, like Keith's uh, character. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, I had that thought watching it that I was curious why the decision to make him the focus as opposed to Fred Hampton. Right. Although I did think, you know, Daniel Kaluuya, yeah, I think he's, he's fantastic. He's phenomenal, yes. And um, yeah, I, I do love uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. I thought it was a great movie. Mm -hmm. But if I, you know, if I'm, I'm nitpicking, I did feel like the film kind of struggles to make me understand, um, I should just look up his name, the actual man that Lucky Stanfield William, was. William, I can't remember his last name. Me, but I, yeah. I don't care to, because. <laughs> like, Wild Bill, so, right? <laughs> I was yeah. like, no, um, you did a horrible thing and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, but I felt like it never really made you understand what was motivating him, like why he right. made the decisions he did. Like yeah. as much time, because yeah, we spend most of the time with him and I feel like I didn't really understand kind of what made him tick and wh why he was asking. Right. And then I didn't yeah. care. And like, and that's the result. Like I just didn't care. I just wanted to hear more about Fred Hampton. I wanted to hear more about um, like, you know the I don't I don't know this is a, like his, his the girlfriend or wife I, they never really said but like yeah. you know, and like being together and all of that and then like the structure or, you know or the organization basically like kind of falling a little bit just because of you know different things that were happening and so I like I wanted more of that um, but yeah, yeah. I, mean, I didn't I didn't feel that I didn't get the the the, the humanization, you know, of that FBI informant. Um, they just didn't. Yeah. Bill O'Neill is, is his name. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I will say, I, I, 
I wasn't as big a fan of Trial of Chicago 7 as, as you were. Like, it's entertaining. It's Aaron Sorkin, so yeah. it's, like, entertaining to watch. Right. But I feel like that... I feel like that does an even worse job of with Fred Hampton. I feel like that he is completely just well, there. Like the yeah, I mean he's like it's it's kind of like an aside, like because he's he's there in the trial and then the judge references him, but like I mean and then like I was saying, like I mean both films I still don't know as much about Fred Hampton after watching because the way in which they do it, it's not, it's not centered, which I understand with, from the coming from the trial of the Chicago seven, but I don't understand it coming from Judas and the Black Messiah. So. Yeah. yeah. Although I, I also thought that, yeah, yeah. Abdul Mateen was, was great as Fred Hampton. So I feel like, I feel yes. like the, the actors playing him in each movie. Oh my were gosh. So good. I was like, I oh. just won't give one of them. Oh God. <laughs> maybe so what was, like what was the the Bob Dylan film where like all the different actors played him? So the, let let them both play him. Right. In one movie. <laughs> I am still here or I am not here. Some, some one yeah, else. something with here, something like that. Yeah. He's not here, right? I don't even remember. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jen yeah. so, yeah. Blue was still even with not a lot of screen time. It was kind of like you see some of those supporting roles where sometimes they don't have to be on screen a lot just to have such an impact because every time he was, it was just amazing. And then of course, yeah, giving the iconic speech, um, which was kind of, which was mostly the trailer was just that speech. So I, I, right. uh, but yeah, that was, that blew me away. And then they play it in the credits and I'm like, and then you could really see how good of a job he did yes. playing that speech in, front of him in that moment. Um, so I'm like, wow, that was amazing. Uh, like Keith Sanfield was great. And I think that was part of it was he's so charismatic and likable yeah. that you did that right. you did root for, uh, for Wild Bill there, even though, you know, maybe in, in the real life situation, it wasn't, yeah. he maybe well, like, wasn't quite like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was interesting. I also had read, I wish I could remember who was saying it. Um, uh, a critic I follow was talking about the decision to cast Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield and those characters because they're so much older than mm. those men were in reality. Because I think right. at the time, um, well, the, was like twenty one, right? Yeah, and the yeah. La- Lakeith's character I believe was seventeen when this was happening, and so wow. casting older actors like I feel like it changes your perception because I feel like if you actually cast like a 17, 18 year old, like I feel like that changes how you're seeing this movie. Mm. Like if you're looking at like a teenager, yes, you, know, you can see how like, of course he's easily manipulated. And like he's a, he's a kid. Um, right. So I thought, I thought that was a really interesting. That's a good point. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> just the a difference. Yeah. yeah. You're not wrong. <laughs> Well, even Bill's story like had a sad ending, which I didn't realize until the the, la- the last. Yeah. It, it was yeah. juxtaposed with uh, him doing an interview with like sixty minutes or something, and then at, at the end, it kind of flashes yeah. to fate after that interview, which is so. Again, it was just an all around. I was like, wow, that was a really good movie, but yeah, but it, it's it's a and then it crushes you again. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough watch knowing, and I I um. I'll be honest, I probably should, have, should be more educated on Fred Hampton. I, I did not realize he was 21. And yeah. I, had the same thought. I was like, is that obviously Daniel Kaluuya, who's not, who's still a young actor, but he, but 21. Right, but he's older than, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So should we, I'm gonna do a hard left turn into- Yeah, this. yeah, the next <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to still talk about a few best pictures. So, Jackie, you haven't seen all these, and I haven't seen all of these, but you had a couple that you you were a big fan of Minari, right? Do you want to give us a yes. little bit of Minari or any of these other best pictures before we before we move on to the snubs, which I know will be a a big topic. Um. Oh my God, Minari. So I went to the a twenty fours website for that one. Um, and like. And I, this was like, I was watching it like late at night. I think I started after, I don't know, 10. It was late, whatever. And I was like watching and I think maybe five or 10 minutes in, I was already in tears. I was like, this is going to, this movie's going to wreck me. Um, and it, which it did. And uh, it's just this really like, it's this Korean family. I think they were, they were in, 
they had they had immigrated from Korea. They had spent some time in California, and then they moved to Arkansas. Um, and um, he's like the father, played by Stephen Young. Like he is who I love dearly. Like, yeah. if you've been on my Twitter account recently, like you'd know it was a full Stephen oh. Young stand account. Um, <laughs> like for real, I love that man. And um, <laughs> he's like, and the, the family. Um, he's like trying to make basically make his own way like you know in this in this society and trying to do everything he possibly can you know to earn money um the the conversations between him and his wife um are just really like heartbreaking because he's doing all this stuff and she's really not like if there's like the conversations between them um are just really heartbreaking and then you have like the relationship so their the grandmother comes in this is all in the church I'm not spoiling anything, but um, like the the relationship between um, so so the son or the grandson and then his grandmother is just like the best. Um, it's fantastic because the grand the grandma is not your typical grandma. Like she's just like kind of just like out there and amazing, um, and fun, and she just says whatever she wants, and it's it's great because like they're trying to fit into American society and. This grandmother is like, nope. And like, it's, it's just, it's just, kind of, and it's like seeing this entire family like go through different things together. Um, it, it is a quintessential American film. Um, and I, I just, I just love it. Um, the little boy is the most adorable. Like, <laughs> QA. I don't know if you saw the Critics' Choice Awards when he won and he was crying, mm-hmm. he lost it. Um, it's, it's just a fantastic film. And so, like, if this, if this, wins like um I'm, I'm gonna just yeah i'm gonna fall out of my seat because it was it was that good of a movie if you have a chance to watch it absolutely watch minari um it's so good so good and it's like that that's my favorite that was my favorite one i mean other than like one night in miami which i will still like okay <laughs> talk about minari was Oh, it was it was my favorite, and I haven't seen. I still I still need to see the Father Mank, Nomadland, and Sound of Metal. But like, um, Minari right now is my favorite. So. Yeah, I, I loved it too. Uh, by the way, when you were talking, so Meg is watching uh, the Falcon and Winter Soldier in the other room. So when you were talking, Marvel music swelled up during your speech. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that's really epic. Oh. Uh, Perfect. Uh, I, I love Minari too. I I thought. Uh, one of my favorite parts was the the grandson and grandma relationship, which was uh, Alan S. Kim was the the young yeah. boy who was who was cute and amazing. Uh, Yoon Yun Jung was the was the grandmother, and their relationship was just I, I loved it. Um, there was one gross part, but it was played for comic relief. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just their reaction, like his. I was talking about. You have to watch it to know what we're talking about. Seriously, <laughs> his like, life. Oh. His line, <laughs> Alan S. Kim's line de- delivery of some of these ones where he goes, he goes, it's it's not called a penis, it's called a ding-dong. <laughs> it's the best line reading. I guess kind of a spoiler. You won't know the kind of it's <laughs> Basically, the grandma just is teasing him and they're going back and forth. It's cute. And, and the movie obviously isn't just about this. I, I, there's some real, there's a lot about a relationship and especially with the, uh, a family dynamic so it's with the the father and, and or yeah the father and then his the mother like kind of their relationship so there's there's a lot going on a lot of layers um yeah I, I loved it again and um I kind of buried one lead which is uh, since this is the little theater podcast the little is reopening of course to the public Friday <laughs> April 16th um as of this recording we haven't locked in our movies but I I, I think I Feel confident enough saying that Minari, there's a good chance Minari will be there. one of those films. Uh, if it's not, you guys can come after me and, and be like, you liar. Um, so if we anyone- have it, We have it on the recording that you said that. Say, yeah. uh, holding it to- we have the receipts. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you the ones that I want, which is Minari and Nomadland for the opening. And we hope that will happen. So if you're, yeah, so you can, if you're wanting to see one of those and you want to see it in the theater, you could plan for the little, and if I turn out to be a liar, you can you can come after me. You can you can like uh, start sending me angry tweets, and I'll I'll understand. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I love Minari. I, I think it's a, a good list. Um, any other thoughts before we go on to snubs and? Oh, we're okay. We'll I th yeah, I think we about covered. Yeah. Yeah, I was making a mental list. I'm like, I think we we covered pretty much everything. I mean, obviously we could talk about it forever, but. Um, yeah. <laughs> so some of us have things to do not me I, I don't have things to do, but the, the important people in the thread uh, so let's let's go with some of the snubs here what or, or just movies that we feel didn't get recognized and, and we talked about it a little um Jackie you, you kind of mentioned some snubs did you want to embellish on, on what you were saying earlier um so I think in our last podcast I pretty much just gave you the full <laughs> like um my feelings about one night in Miami um, I do like that it is um, up for a, a best adopted or adapted adopted, adapted screenplay. Um, I do, I, I did like that because I thought that a lot of the writing, the, the, the dialogue, especially because this is a fictional retelling of like that night. Um, I think it's, I think it was very well done. So at least if it's, you know, if it's not up for best picture, which it isn't, um, if it wins that I'll like, I will be thrilled. Um, Cause I just, some sort of recognition would be great. Um, another one, this is a long shot, but like, I really enjoyed this movie and this movie really surprised me was the invisible man. Mm -hmm. um, like I, cause I went in with like low expectations. Like, I just think it's going to be like a popcorn movie. You know, it'll be fun. Elizabeth Moss is amazing. Like I was just like, yeah, I'll just go see it to see it. But then like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, there are a lot of things in this movie that are really surprising me. And like that were actually well done um and so some sort of recognition like i guess like would would be nice for the invisible man but yeah i yeah. Uh, um yeah i i thought that might have snuck in there in like one of the some of the technical categories yeah right yeah. well again why can't a horror movie like invisible man or a comedy like palm springs like why can't those be nominated for best picture those are two of my favorite movies of the year and i do think we should have a best comedy category i've talked about it i think there should be a best horror category maybe but if you actually gave those love for best picture then we wouldn't need these separate categories well yeah. and i think like I, I think a lot of it of course has to do with the people who are like judging these i think it also just has to do with you know this sense of like tradition because it's always like the same kind of films you know that are up for the oscars and i feel like well okay if you truly want to celebrate cinema it should be all cinema like all genres not just not just dramas you know um because like you were saying before um scott like it would be fantastic if we did have a comedy in there it would be fantastic if we did have like a horror film um that has been done where i mean midsummer as much as that terror <laughs> Um, I was like, or just creep, not terrified, but just creeped me out. Um, I, but it was a well done film. Um, so, I mean, that would have been cool if it were nominated, um, Invisible Man. Like, like these things, there are so many like layers to some of these movies, but I think people are truly missing out just because of the genre that it's been put in. Um, a best, like a documentary also being put in the best picture, I think would be, amazing as well um what was it 76 days i thought was what very well done um i would have liked to have seen some recognition there um like i mean you're in the heart of it you're in wuhan and you know you're seeing all these families and patients like go through this you know with COVID 19 and, and not that we need a reminder but at the same time it's still very uh impactful um, especially just watching people go through this and stuff and yeah so I, I, think, I think if you're gonna recognize cinema, it needs to be all genres, not just the ones that you prefer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I feel like, I'm hoping that changes. Like, like I said, with the, as the, the kind of makeup of the Academy changes, I hope some of those terrible traditions fall away and they realize that you know, they, can, they can honor horror and comedy um because yeah i'm with you scott that i i would have loved to see palm springs show up somewhere as well um although i whenever a comedy uh nomination does come through i'm always happy so i was i was thrilled to see uh maria bakalova get in there for supporting actress for the borat sequel uh the borat subsequent movie film um 
but yeah, I feel no respect, no respect for horror and comedy. And I hope that changes. I'm with you. Yeah, I mean, Borat did get some love and I kind of thought that was because of its timeliness, um, which again, with 76 days should have because, you know, it, it was about the coronavirus and in the first 76 days in Wuhan. And I thought Borat did because, so they were filming Borat and then obviously the, the pandemic hit and, and that was then factored into the movie. Um, they, just like the first Borat, they expose um, just a lot of, um, a lot of serious issues in America and this was like white supremacy and politicians like it makes Rudy Giuliani like obviously we all know who he is and it really exposes him for being you know he's with his 15 year old girl like <laughs> you know being being very perverted and and it's like okay so I, I thought that's why I thought that's why Borat got some love just because of that it really had, it was very topical, even though I, I enjoyed the first Borat a lot more. Like I loved the first Borat, I thought it was funny. This one, I, I was like, okay, I appreciate what they're doing, but I really didn't didn't enjoy it as much. I don't know if that was just me, but, um, but I, I do think going with a topical route earned them some, both Golden Globe wins and nominations and now the, the Oscar nominations as well. Um, a couple of snubs I have, and I think of, when I think of snubs, I think of a lot of movies that screen in the early part of the year which mm -hmm. which gets they get snubbed any other year because i yeah. kind of forgets about a good movie apparently which is why the oscar movies are released normally in november and december yeah, um, they have a very short memory yeah it's but, but movies like the assistant uh first cow mm -hmm. um and and one that i really liked which was um, never rarely sometimes always um i thought that had some of the best performances uh, but there were very quiet, understated performances, which the Oscar doesn't like. It's like, it likes Joaquin Phoenix as a Joker or Gary Oldman, look at him. He's transformed into Winston Churchill, amazing. But I think it's the acting is more about like portraying where you're like just the, um, the most powerful scene of any movie I saw the whole year was the, um, the main actress, uh, Cindy Flanagan, um, who's from Buffalo or who has Buffalo ties. And the only dialogue that she says for this entire scene is the title of the movie, either never, rarely, sometimes, or always. Um, and just because of the context of it, it's just it's so powerful and it just blew me away. And I'm like, that's what we should be recognizing. It's not, yeah, I mean, it's not anything like she's not putting on makeup and acting crazy, but I'm like, that is acting. And that, so I, I was a little bummed to see that movie not get any love. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I, I would have loved all of those to, to get in there, especially, yeah, I, I think last time we recorded, I I went out about The Assistant and how much I love that movie and Julia Garner's performance in it. But yeah, it's it's just, those movies are, too, I feel like, too subtle and people, for whatever reason, want the, the showy performances and the, you know, the movies they could point to and be like, that is acting you can you can quantify it like it's it's big you can't miss it um which yeah is frustrating yeah and i not to take away from people who were nominated i mean francis mcdormand yeah. in nomadland was was great i was i was saying before the podcast that wasn't my favorite movie of the year but it was a movie where i really liked the directing of it um because i was watching it and I didn't do a lot of reading beforehand. And I'm like, are these, it almost plays like part documentary in it. And I was like, are these real people? Is this scripted? And they actually is real people. And it's based on a nonfiction book. Um, and they have the real people that are in the, in the film. Um, and just the stories in that were great. And I guess that wasn't a super show, like Francis McDormand, I guess you could say that was kind of showy in a way, but not really. Like that was a pretty quiet, understated performance for the most part as well. And yeah. And yeah, I think that's I just, that's a great performance. And yeah, I I do love Nomadland and uh, Chloe Zhao. That's uh, that's kind of her her method. All of her films, she's used um, non actors um, to fill out the her casts. Um, and I feel like that adds an authenticity to her films that you know you wouldn't get otherwise. She's yeah. So I'm I'm th I I have been a fan of Chloe Zhao. Um, uh, she's done a few movies before this. The the writer was her previous film, which is also great. Um, so, but I'm so excited to see her career take off the way it has. And I think I think last time we recorded, I mentioned that it'll be interesting. I mean, when she's at this point where I feel like she's likely to win an Oscar, and then she's also got a Marvel movie coming up, which just 
blows my mind <laughs> to yeah. know that she's gone from these tiny films to now to know that that's coming and see where where she goes from there and what she does with with that kind of film i'm, I'm really excited to see yeah she's slated to also make um a bass reeves film um which oh, i'm I really 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 excited about um when it gets off the, whenever it gets off the ground um yeah. so you don't know so bass reeves is um the first black um deputy marshal um to serve um east of the mississippi um and uh like the just if, if you just like google his story it is amazing i think he arrested over like three thousand people um and of, to which like 18 i think 18 people like sh tried to shoot at him and he never got shot once um, he's also rumored to be the inspiration for the Lone Ranger. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Yeah. So, so like, I'm first of all, I've been wanting that movie forever, and then the fact that Golden Globe winner Chloe Zhao is now like doing that is just, I'm like, I'm I'm in, I'm ready, let's go. Um, so I'm excited for that too. Yeah. Yeah, that's I right. I forgot. I love to see talented people get there too. Um, I was trying to look up the name of the, the Bass Reeves movie, but I couldn't find it. But I did find that Chloe Zhao is only two years older than I am. And I'm like, oh man. What? <laughs> you gotta get on this. <laughs> Why do I always think that the director's like older than I <laughs> always say? Like, I always think that, yeah. What is it about human nature? We just get jealous when we see talented people. <laughs> but, but not that we are all talented, but I'm not winning Oscar. <laughs> I'm just complaining about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you guys want to dive into some of these smaller categories? Obviously, we, we focus a lot on the best picture, but I, I really like kind of some of these other categories. I think I'm almost more invested in. Um, Adam, is there anyone in particular that kind of caught oh, your gosh. eye? If not, I can direct you toward one that I want to talk about. I guess I feel like I know which one you were going to, so I'll just toss <laughs> out uh, animated feature. <laughs> that, that's the one. <laughs> yes, nailed it. Um, cause yeah, I think I'm with you in what you're, I feel like you're about to say, uh, Wolf Walkers is just amazing. Um, similarly, you were talking about earlier, uh, that was the movie that, uh, I saw the first time in a theater since the shutdown that I was able to take advantage of a little private screening. Um, and that's what, uh, my partner and I, Matt chose, um, because I just wanted to see that movie on the big screen and it was worth it. It's so good. But yeah, yeah I, I, will, I know you wanted to talk about that a lot, so. Well, I, one of the main reasons I was intrigued by it was because how much you and Matt were, were praising it, and then I saw others. Um, so I, I did, I liked other animated movies in the category, like I, I, I like Soul quite a bit. I thought Onward was kind of underrated, but yeah, Wolfwalkers, I thought, well, first of all, I liked the animation part mm -hmm. um, the most, and that the animation was gorgeous. Um, the story, so I ended up watching it on St. Patrick's Day since it took place in Ireland. I thought that was kind of fitting. And it's, it's about this English girl who she moves here and, and there's wolves and they're like, we have to rid these wolves from the, the woods here. Um, and then she ends up going and meeting a, a wolf walker who, uh, what a wolf walker is, and this isn't really a spoiler, it's just kind of setting up the movie, is a human who when they sleep, they become a wolf and they, they can run around. So I had a real magical element. And I'm like, man, I just want to go quit everything, venture to the woods and become a wolf walker, like get bit and get this magical wolf powers and just roam with my pack. I'm like, that's the life. Uh, but it was just a charming, whimsical story. And um, obviously like there was, I, I feel like I'm one of those people where even though it's the animated animals, I'm like, do, do not hurt those wolves. You leave the, you could hurt, you could rip apart a human. I don't care. Um, but you leave the wolves alone. There was like an owl in it. I'm like, you do not hurt that owl. The owl better be okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a, a charming movie and I, I like I said I liked Soul a lot so I kind of thought like I, I think I'm going to be pulling for Soul in this one um, but after watching Wolf Walkers I don't know if it's just recency bias I, I think that was my my favorite I, I don't think it'll I think Pixar unless the Pixar movies split but I think usually Pixar wins um, yeah, although I did like the Pixar short for best animated uh, short feature, which was Burrow, which yeah. was one of the most adorable movies I watched all year, which I liked a lot. Um, yeah, it was super cute. I, I will say I haven't seen uh, the Shaun the Sheep movie, Farmageddon, um, and I really want to, because I loved the first Shaun the Sheep movie. And uh, so yeah, that's that, I think it's the only one 
of the animated feature category I haven't seen. Um, so I'll have to get to that because I'm a Shaun the Sheep fan from way back. <laughs> Actually, I should probably uh, be a good host and read off the, the categories for that. Okay, so the so so our listeners know, although we actually mentioned most of them, but the, the nominees for animated uh, feature film are Onward, which was a Pixar movie, uh, Over the Moon, a, Sh- a Shaun the Sheep movie, Farmageddon, uh, Soul, and, and Wolf Walkers were, uh, were the movies for that. Um, and for the animated shorts, which I mentioned quickly, um, we, again, this is not confirmed, but hopefully we'll be getting the, the uh, Oscar nominated shorts for the virtual little uh, April 2nd. So we will have those in some capacity. It's, it's always a favorite at the little of both people, fans, and, and also one of my favorites too. I love watching the, the Oscar shorts. Um, so we should have them in the virtual little so you can even watch them before the little opens, which is uh, pretty neat. Jackie, did you have a, one of these other categories that uh, you particularly had a passion for or wanted to talk about? Oh, um, okay, uh, let's see. So I have been, like I said, I'm a little behind as far as just like overall, pretty much just based on these nominations and stuff, because there's still so much I want to see. Like I'm counting on those Oscar shorts for real. Um, those are one of my favorites, like every year is like listen, it's watching the shorts and stuff. Um, let's see, I'm two things. One is um, according to the Academy, just going back to Judas and the Black Messiah for a second. According to the Academy, so who's the lead? <laughs> and the Black Messiah. Yeah. <laughs> like um, both the Keith, both the Keith and Daniel are up for supporting role. Yeah, that's a little that awkward. Like, like, who are they supporting? Is it Jesse Plemons? Right. <laughs> like no. <laughs> yeah. It's it like so confused. Well, everyone was confused. I just saw it across my Twitter feed. Like, who's the lead? Who's the lead? Just like, uh-huh. am I wrong yeah. though? I, I think the reason they do that it's what the what the movie submits as it. So they probably thought Lakeith would have a better chance for a supporting actor and submitted that. Is that is that incorrect, Adam? No, you said that's that's usually how that works. But from my understanding. Um, Lakeith was submitted as actor, but he just happened to get more votes in the supporting category. If I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what I had read, that he, the studio submitted him as, as lead, but the voters decided otherwise, which, yeah, made that category kind of awkward. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm happy nominated, so I guess that's good. Oh my yeah. gosh. What? Yeah, it's just, it's confusing, and this is dumb. But yeah, we're build the system back up. This is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, but every year, I the the academy always has trouble deciding what a supporting role is because I feel like most of the nominees in those categories end up being questionable about whether they're actually supporting. But which I'll, I will say also makes me super happy that. Uh, Paul Racy um, got in for Sound of Metal because I feel like he is truly a supporting actor in that movie and he so deserved it. And I love when those kind of nominations happen where kind of an under the radar actor, like that that will make his career. Like he won't have any problem getting roles from, from now because now he's an Oscar nominee. And I, I kind of, I just, I love when that happens because it, it's so deserving. It's, he's so good in that movie all around. Watch Sound of Metal. It's great. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, also, so I'm going to be that person. I feel like Tenet got a lot of hate. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm sorry. I liked it. What do you want from me? I, I liked it too. Like, yeah. And I was just like, it's, what, is it only nominated for like best? Uh, I'm like trying to go down the list here. And it's only nominated for like one, yeah, best visual, wait, best visual effects and best production production. design. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, but cinematography, maybe? (laughs) Soundtrack? It had a good soundtrack. I like the soundtrack. Yeah. And I'm just like, I I don't, I don't understand. I, I, I I don't, I I get some criticisms with it, but I don't get the hate like towards, towards the film, which I've seen. And I'm like, 
it's you know what you're getting with Christopher Nolan. I don't. You guys have been through this. Like, come on. Like, <laughs> whatever. But I, yeah, I would have liked to see it in more categories. Just, I really did enjoy that movie. And like I said, I do have my critiques about it, especially when it comes like, I think to the, it was the only well two. There's two female characters in there, but like, come on, guys. Like, there needs to be more, obviously. Um, and especially with the role um that the main woman was given who, whose name is escaping me for whatever reason um and and like yeah like i she she needed more to do i think in that film other than that though like i really enjoyed the movie and um i just would like to see it get more awards or nominations at least so yeah. it, it was elizabeth debicki uh who was also great uh, it's like it was like right there and i'm like i why can't i remember her name I've seen yeah, it so she, many times. She was kind of like presented as a damsel in distress, which I yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I like Tenet too, though. I thought it was a, a messy movie that maybe didn't make sense, but I had fun with it. I was like, yeah. I, I like time. I like time travel movies, even if they don't make sense or are stupid. But, I, but that's my jam. Be, like that, I would not be that want to be that screenwriter that's trying to figure out everything because that's messy. No matter what. We all know now like how messy Back to the Future was and how inaccurate it was. But like other but other movies that have done film or yeah, other movies that have done film. Other movies I can't talk today. Other movies that have done time, like I don't know, like one of my favorites is Looper. And I'm mean, like it's it kind of gets a little foggy in there, but I mean I don't know if there's a right way necessarily to do time because it's so difficult. So like I I empathize with those screenwriters because I'm like oh that's a hard job that that right there is figuring out that so like whoever like kudos to the writer for that film because that was oh yeah <laughs> I, they might have given up though on that <laughs> <You didn't laughs> it wasn't it wasn't okay. quite the, yeah Just go with it <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't quite the looper level for me, but I, I enjoyed it. I was like, I would watch it again and try to figure out what went on. I thought it was neat and it certainly had its flaws. And I think part of the backlash may have been just its release. Like it was going to come out in July and then they just were real stubborn with it and wanted it to come out in theater. Yeah. And, and I get it. It's meant for the big screen. I mean, all Nolan's films, like, they were meant for the big screen, but unfortunately, like we needed it. Like, there were people who wanted to see it and I, like me. And so- I don't know it's just yeah last year was just it was a good it was a good year for film but it was also a messy year for film like with everything oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean a lot of these movies that i like and saw i almost all of them were on the small screen and yeah. <laughs> almost everyone i was like oh i would have liked to have seen that in the big screen now nomadland is one i mean just the imagery in that is beautiful that was meant for the big screen and i'm like i'm, I'm watching it yeah. on my tv or mm -hmm. which i have a nice tv a lot of people do but it, it's just not the same and that's why people right theaters not the same at all i saw a promising young woman on the big screen so those oh. were like in your face um yeah it, it was ooh, it was unnerving oh so 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 many kudos to that crew seriously for like the coloring of that it's just i want to hear that britney spears uh cello oh my god on loud speakers <laughs> Oh my God, the director, yeah, um, Emerald, she, so I was watching, um, I've been on like this YouTube kick of just like watching actors. There's a series that's actors on actors and there's also one that's directors on directors. So it was Emerald and, and Olivia Wilde who were talking. So Olivia Wilde, who's the genius behind Booksmart, um, they were both talking and Emerald said like she had a playlist that she would send out to her crew and there's like so many Britney Spears songs um, that are on there, um, and that was that was also cool. So I don't know if you're if you're watching and everything or listening, and you're like, you know, you want like more extras just on top of like these movies and stuff coming out. Definitely go out and like watch the the interviews. You know, not just not just with the actors, but also the directors. Just, like, like get their thought process because um, it's always fascinating to hear. Um, yeah. yeah, there was a lot of Britney Spears going on. <laughs> I'm glad Britney is getting her due now. I, she was treated poorly. <laughs> free Hashtag Britney. Tag free Britney. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so real quick, other category. I'm going to read off our documentary uh, ones here quickly because there is one, as I mentioned before, that I uh, have a particular passion for. 
uh, which one was was uh, Boy State, which did not get nominated. But for feature, um, Collective is one, which I think it should be on streaming soon as well. Uh, Crook think- Camp, which is on Netflix. Uh, which the is Mole, great. Yeah. Uh, My Octopus Teacher and Time. So I, I think a lot of those are streaming. Uh, the Mole Agent was one of my favorites, which was on Hulu, and it's also available in some virtual cinemas. Um, and so the basic plot behind this was um, there's someone who um, who their parent, I think it's in, in a nursing home and they're suspecting that there's some wrongdoing in this nursing home. So they reach out to a private detective. Um, so he hires this 81 year old man to go undercover as a mole agent in the nursing home to try to uncover wrongdoing. Um, and they, the older man is the most adorable like kindest human possible. And I just, I, I just want to see a cinematic universe with this man in it. Um, so the movie, it, I, I think it has some funny moments, a lot of human moments. There's a lot of sadness, especially it deals a lot with loneliness, um, especially within nursing homes, which was tough, especially in our pandemic year. Um, so there is a lot of like kind of, it's a tough watch at times, but most of the tears in it are happy tears. Um, and I, I just love this movie so much. I, I Like I said, I would have, maybe had it as as best picture even I liked it that much uh, so that that's the that's my documentary that I'd really push although um our, our documentary expert Linda Maroney recommends I, some of the other ones she's recommended like Crip Camp um I, like, say, I was gonna say I, go I, I, I love Crip Camp um that's on Netflix um and it's about uh the formation of a summer camp for uh, disabled kids uh, in the 70s and it follows how the people who attended that camp um, ended up you know seeding the creating the foundation for the disability rights foundation for like decades to come and it's just it's such a good documentary it's so inspiring and occasionally maddening um, but it's it's just it's so good it's definitely one that stuck with me and also Time, um, I'd also recommend, um, which is about a woman, uh, Fox Rich. Um, it follows, um, she recorded herself um, after um, her husband um, was, was imprisoned and it kind of follows her raising um, their sons um, and carrying on without him and it's, it's a it's a sad movie, um, but not not devastating. I don't want to get into you know I don't know. Do, do, are there spoilers in a documentary? Like I feel like it it's life, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's so good. It's the way um, the filmmaker uh, who I'm drawing a blank on Garrett Bradley. Um, she the way she uses the footage over decades um so i think i think i think it's 20 years that is the over the course of the movie and the way it follows that family is just incredible um so i hope people check that out I, the, that's streaming on amazon prime um so that's readily available so i hope yeah i haven't seen collective i've heard it's great but definitely yeah time and crip camp i can i can highly recommend I think my octopus teacher is on Netflix too, which I I haven't seen, but the yes, I, I haven't seen that one either. It looks beautiful, um, and you know, I, again, it's a story about nature, and I, I think it's this guy, and he forms like almost like a bond with an octopus. He's a, obviously a scuba diver, and he goes in, um, and it's kind of the lessons that he learned from this kind of ancient, mysterious creature that I don't think we know a lot about, which is the, the octopi. So uh, I, I was intrigued by pretty much all these docs. I, I, I watch more documentaries than I think any other genre of film this year. We watched a lot for, for our One Take Film Festival that unfortunately did not end up happening this year. Um, and I just, there was so much good stuff and a lot of good stuff that I don't even think have been released yet. Um, stuff like Whirly Bird, um, few others I can't remember the title off the top of my head but there, there was a lot, a lot of good uh, doc titles so I, I'll be interested to see how this category plays out um, Oscar night do you guys want to give us some predictions do you feel bold, and, bold enough to do that <laughs> no idea honestly I well, really don't to, and you're going to be held accountable if you get them wrong <laughs> so that's how it's happening um yeah I don't know let's see what do I want to start with here 
Well, we, we haven't touched upon acting too much, so maybe let's I was go going to say, yeah. Uh... So actor in a supporting role, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen for The Trial of Chicago 7, Daniel Kaluuya. Oh, I'm reading supporting. Yeah, so this is supporting. I'll, I'll mention this. So Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, Daniel Kaluuya for Judas and the Black Messiah, Leslie Odom Jr., One Night in Miami, Paul Racy, Sound of Metal, and then Lakeith Stanfield, Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, I'm going to go actor in a leading role. Riz Ahmed, uh, Sound of Metal, Chadwick Boseman, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, uh, Anthony Hopkins, The Father, Gary Oldman, Mank, and Stephen Young, uh, Minari. So any um, any particular mm -hmm. predictions on who might that win? That seems at? impossible. Um, like, okay. All right, so I'm gonna go with who I think they might give it to, and then, I, and then I'll also say who I really, really, really hope it goes to. Um, I think they may give it to Chadwick just because like doing the post post honestly like that um, because he's been getting so many awards. I think that's where I also like tend to predict um, and everything. Like if I see a bunch of award shows giving it to this person, like I'm like, okay, more than likely the Oscars might also see it go his way. Um, of course, I really want Stephen Young to win. I think that Goes without saying, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. Um, and then, um, yeah, or like, I mean, I don't know. It, like, again, because these are all incredible actors. And so, yeah, but I think it may go to Chadwick. Um, for best actor in a supporting role, I think it might go to Daniel. Again, because that's where I've see, been seeing these other awards giving him. And like, like he's, he's fantastic, honestly, that, for one night in my Miami, though, I probably wouldn't have like Leslie did a fantastic job, but I think Kin Kinsley Benader, he I think did a better job. Like it's <sighs> Leslie did a fantastic job, but I think Ben that or not Ben Kinsley. I always want to say Ben Kingsley, but it's Kingsley. <laughs> ah, his name is Kingsley Benader. Um, he I think he just. His, his performance was just, he just knocked it out of the park for me. So that would have been my nomination from that film. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking for best actor in supporting role, it may go to Daniel, um, which I mean, I'm fine with because his performance was also amazing. And that's me yeah. having have seen like um, The Sound of Metal. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I think we, we talked about last time we recorded that. Yeah, but I, I'm right there with you that I thought, uh, Kingsley Benadir, uh, he was the standout for me too in in One Night in Miami. So I was yeah. hoping that he was the he would be the one that got singled out. Um, if they had yeah. to just pick one, um, yeah. but yeah, I'm I I feel like they might go Daniel Kaluuya, but I also I don't know. I also have a sneaking sus suspicion. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen. Oh, <laughs> it just it, it, he wouldn't be my pick, but. I don't know. Something about that. I feel like my gut tells me that that is very much a possibility. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I also agree with you that I think Chadwick uh, Boseman yeah. uh, may end up getting it for actor, which, yeah, because there's, I mean, obviously there's the uh, being able to honor him posthumously. Yes. Um, but it's also, it's also an incredible performance, like truly. We haven't really talked about Ma Rainey uh, my writing's black bottom, um, but he's he's just fantastic in it. It's mm. it it's I I don't it's hard to say, but I, I would say it's like the performance of his career. And so it's, mm. it's his last night. I feel like that. I, I, I yeah, I'd be fine with that. I think it's it's it would be a deserving win, um, and it would be a way to to honor him and the fact that we're missing out on. On yeah. how many performances that he would have given, <sighs> um, it's just just heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it's it's great, and I hope m more people check out that movie as well because yeah, him mm -hmm. and Viola Davis, the the whole ensemble of that movie, I think are great. But he's he's phenomenal. Just thinking of the Oscar moment and him winning, I'm gonna be a mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, I I didn't watch all of the the Golden Globes, but I did see um, his wife accepting his award, which was just oof. 
like that was rough so yeah, yeah i yeah. don't know if i can handle um, if yeah, she no. also uh -uh. both years yeah, yeah no what about best Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I, I know there is a, a, a little, um, there was momentum um, probably back in the fall for Riz Ahmed for um, Song mm. of Metal, which I, I thought he, he blew me away in that as well. Um, yeah. But again, it, it's like one of the things where there's a bunch of deserving performances that, you know, you can't really be be angry unless maybe it's Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, yes, that I would. Who should have been, about. he should have played Freddie Mercury in the Queen movie and then. He could have he could have won for that, and then he wouldn't have. Honestly, and you know what? If we're gonna talk about performances in the trial of the Chicago Seven, honestly, sorry, but I actually liked Eddie Redmayne's performance more. I like preferred his just because of like, I don't, I, I don't know, I, yeah, like Sasha Baron Cohen, like his character or figure or whatever, like he didn't stand out to me. Like it's a great, like it's a it's a great performance, but. For me, like, yeah, one that knocks it out of the park for me would have been Eddie Redmayne's, because um, that's, yeah, he's great in it, but, but I don't want that one. <laughs> I don't want that one. <laughs> Sorry. No. Yeah. Although, although while we're so talking about actors, actors, I was just going to say, I didn't get a chance. Oh, wait, no, go. Yeah, go. I was just really quickly, I realized I forgot to mention when we were talking about snubs um, for actor. I was really hoping Delroy Lindo would be able to get mm. into Five Bloods. Five Bloods. It was just fantastic. And I'm sad that that movie kind of apparently fell off the Academy's radar because I think it only got score. Which is... I think that was it. Which, I, yeah, I was really sad that that didn't get more attention. And especially Delroy Lindo because I thought he was he was fantastic. And that was June. That wasn't even that late. And that's Spike right. Lee. Like, how are you yeah. going to like a Spike Lee movie? And, uh. Yeah. I, so, for the sake of time, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to actress here quickly. So, supporting uh, Maria Bakalova for for a subsequent movie film delivery of Prodig prodigious bride to America regime for make benefits once glorious nation of Kaz Kazakhstan. Uh, Glenn Close, Hillbilly Elegy, Olivia Coleman, the father, Amanda Seyfried Mank. And Yu Jung Yoon uh, Minari, um, which I, I probably shouldn't have. I'm like the sake of time. Let me read the entire Borat title. <laughs> I kind of wanted to try it, and then I, I butchered it. So that was a bad decision. Is um, it less actress in leading role? Oh, okay. sorry. Uh, I'll just read these off quickly. Uh, leading role: sure. Viola Davis, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Andra Day, The United States versus Billie Holiday, Vanessa Kirby, Pieces of a Woman. Francis McDormand, Nomadland, and Carrie Mulligan, Promising Young Woman. Uh, so I'm sorry, what were you saying, Jackie? So, oh, I was gonna say this, so, well, number one, is it shorter or longer than the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford? Actually, no, I think that one, I think Borat tops it. So yeah, cause I always just like, you just could have cut it after, but whatever. Um, That's funny. Uh, no, or best actress in the leading role. This, again, the number one reminded me that I have more movies to watch. And also, like, this seems impossible. And how do you put, first of all, like, Viola Davis. <laughs> like, she's, she, she's amazing. And, like, well, all of these actresses are amazing. Like, I, I don't know who to say. Like, I think just given what I've seen from other awards, uh, it might be on Andra Day. Or if they may give it to Francis McDermott or Vanessa, like I, or I like I don't know. I have no idea with the leading role. I just don't know. We need a prediction, Jackie. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to go with Andra. There, I said it. I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> I also don't know. So, Adam, give us tell us what's going to happen here. Yeah, Adam, right. tell us. Please tell us. Um, I will. I will agree that I think it's close. Um, I'm going to go with Carrie Mulligan, actually. Really? I okay. think that that's going to be the place where they decide to reward that movie. And it's, and it's a great performance. So that's my prediction. I'm, I'm sticking with it. Carrie Mulligan. We'll see. <laughs> so any, before we wrap up, any other Oscar predictions or stuff you'd like to see here on, on Oscar night in, in April? <clears throat> 
Um, I was just going to say best actress in the supporting role, um, the grandmother from Minari. So yeah, Yeo Jung Yun. Yeah, she. I want her. I want to see her take it because oh, that that performance is outstanding. Just. Yeah. I'm sorry, Glenn Close, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh God! Oh, I hope I hope Glenn Close doesn't. I love Glenn Close, but I do not love that movie. <laughs> and if she wins for that, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I feel like that will have that's, a lot to say. Um, yeah, that's in keeping with the Oscars. Like, so of course, I feel like that means that yes, she will. That will be the role that she wins for. That. <laughs> But I, I'm with you. I, I would absolutely love uh, Ya Zhang Yun uh, for Minari. I would love her to win, but I, I don't think that's going to happen, unfortunately. No, no, but. but she would, she would be my, my, heart, my heart's pick. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if I mentioned this in our last podcast. I might have, but I think my new favorite genre is adorable, like older figure yeah. with adorable child, like driveways, which oh, also driveway. got you know, yeah. Uh, Brian Dennehy, we didn't see. Oh. So, so that's why Minari, the grandmother, she needs to win to, to do justice for my new favorite genre. Yes. Yes, I would have loved Driveways to show up anywhere since that was my favorite movie the, this past year. Um, yeah, especially, yeah, I would have loved Brian Dennehy to get in there. Mm-hmm. <sighs> but again, I feel like that was too small a movie that the Academy forgot about it. Um, Oh, I do want to mention, um, we didn't talk about a whole lot of uh, international feature film category. Um, I just wanted to shout out to, whoop, shout out, oh boy, um, uh, Quo Vadis Eda, um, it, which is a phenomenal movie um, about the Bosnian genocide in the mid 90s, um, but it's about a UN translator um, and her efforts to to save her husband and her sons. And it's just, it is, I will warn you, a devastating movie, but it is incredible. It's so good. Um, so if you have an opportunity, uh, Quo Vadis Eda, definitely check that out. We're hoping to get it in the virtual lit all. Uh, the distributor needs to give us an answer, but hopefully they're listening. Fingers uh, crossed. The answer is yes. <laughs> Um, were you gonna were you gonna give any other international shout outs in there too um i i I also loved another round which uh, unfortunately those are the only two out of that code category i've seen um but another round was also great a very different movie uh, about a group of friends experimenting with with binge drinking um starring (laughs) nicholson um also worth because i i believe that that did play the the virtual little earlier this year. Um, it did, yes. So, if you uh, haven't seen that, definitely that's and worth. And Thomas Vinterberg uh, nominated for oh, best yes. director from another round, which I thought was that's a right. surprise too, uh, which is cool to see. Yeah, yeah, like a happy surprise. Yeah, um, um, if you if you missed another round when it was in the virtual little, it is on Hulu. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts before we wrap it up? I, I was given a deadline of noon here, and we're at, we're only at eleven fifty three. I told you we would go. <laughs> I have seven minutes to to play with you. That's plenty of time. I'm gonna get Jackie on another rant. I'm like, Jackie, give me your, give me your no. thoughts on Interstellar soundtrack while you're driving. No. It. <laughs> no. Listen, I keep telling you that needs to be another just. We just need to talk about scores on one podcast. That's it. Because honestly, I can pack, and you know this, I can pack a ton about scores. It'd have to be like a series. Because I feel like even if you did an hour, I still wouldn't yeah, have enough. Um, I'm behind on scores this year too, by the way, which is awful. Yeah. Well, the good part is we have lots of time to catch up. We don't, we don't have a deadline to watch these by the Oscars. We can watch them That's at our true. own leisure. I'm not voting. <laughs> Although it'd be really cool if I did vote. <laughs> You'd see a lot more Palm Springs love yeah. and uh, driveways would definitely mm-hmm. give a lot of love. Yeah. All right. Any, yeah. so any, any final thoughts then? My arm disappeared. Look at that. 
<laughs> God, we reached that. We reached that part of the podcast now. Yeah, uh, I I think we covered all the things I am I'm super passionate about. I uh, yeah. I didn't freeze up this time either. Normally my Zoom my internet feeds and look at this smooth Ellie. I'm gonna like freeze up right now. I was gonna say <laughs> you just the end of this podcast is gonna be a mess. You're just gonna disappear. I always freeze on a goofy face. Like, is it possible to freeze when you're not talking? And ha- I'm like, oh, it's impossible. <laughs> I hate it. Uh, anyway, we're done. We're done. See you, Oscar Knight. Uh, thank you to my guest, uh, Jackie McGriff, uh, photographer, film super fan, soundtrack super fan. We'll do that podcast at some point. It's coming. Uh, thank you to Adam Lubito, uh, writer and film critic for City Newspaper, uh, City News, rather. Uh, thank you so much. We, uh, we enjoyed talking to Oscars. We're... We're looking forward to probably breaking it down afterward and and having a lot of thoughts on that. So uh, thank you to everyone who watched Movies in a Microphone, brought to you by WXXI and the Little Theater. Remember, it's always a good time to take a little break. 